Hi everyone, so I'm back with another video looking at gas exchange essentials. So essentially I will be looking at the respiratory system. I know previously in the last video or one of the previous videos I uploaded, it spoke about the cardiovascular system. And just to mention, the cardiovascular and the respiratory system goes hand in hand. So I'm going to talk about some of the essentials regarding respiration and how that plays a role in keeping you alive and homeostasis. So in this picture, what we're looking at is just a brief overview of what the actual respiratory system looks like. So we see here that air normally comes in through your nasal cavity. So that's where the respiratory system starts. And in the nose, there's filtration system, like um, you have mucus, you have hairs that will trap debris that may be in the air. All right. So um, it also helps to start warming the air and making sure that it's kind of moisturized so when it comes down into the lower part of the respiratory tract that is the air is moist, clean, and we can have a nice atmosphere to make sure that gas can be exchanged, purified air. All right, so the air will then pass through um, and will go into the trachea. There's a, a little flap that kind of um, covers the opening of the trachea or the glottis and what that flap is called is called epiglottis and it prevents food and drink from entering the trachea okay so that's why you know when they said that you're eating you're not supposed to um, be talking because if you talk then the epiglottis will open and food can just easily enter into trachea and we know that is really not a good situation Okay, so as the air continues down the trachea, it enters into um, bronchi or bronchus that we see here. Um, then those will further branch out. You see these little things that look like trees branching out? Those are called bronchioles, right? At the end of the bronchioles, we have what's called alve alveoli, and we see them here these little grape like looking sacs. And what surrounds the alveolar or alveolar region are um, capillaries and the capillaries are going to be critical at gas exchange which I'll talk about. Um, also just to mention within we, this whole area is called a lung and we'll talk a little bit more about the anatomy of the lung and we have the diaphragm and what's not shown here the muscles that are around the ribs that will aid in breathing. Okay, let's take a, a deeper look at the anatomy of the respiratory system. I want to first start out with the lungs. We have uh, two general um, parts of the lungs. We have the right lung and the left lung. I want you to notice here that the left lung has a cutout for the heart. Okay, so this is called the cardiac notch because the heart is found on the left side. Now, there are fissures that are found in the lungs, like here we have the oblique fissure, for example. Um, here's another oblique fissure. We have a horizontal fissure on the right side of the lungs. We have lobes to the lungs, including superior lobes. Superior means top, okay? And we also have inferior lobes. And, you know, even though it's not shown here, there are segments also to the lungs. All right, so, um, and let's come up here really quickly. Just want to show you once again the alveola or the alveolus region where we have our capillaries surrounding this region. This is where we have gas exchange occur. We have veins, pulmonary veins and arteries that actually will give branches to these capillaries. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go on. Um, just to also mention, if you take anything like human gross anatomy, um, you know, we spoke about the bronchus or the bronchi. They also have several um, lobular bronchi there. We have a superior, we have um, the inferior, and middle. So just to mention that. Let's just discuss briefly the histology or the tissues found in the respiratory tract. What do they look like? So here we see we are zooming up on the respiratory tract and let's look at some of this tissue. 
Now, remember, the air that we're breathing in outside is not clean. We have dust particles, we have bacterial spores, we have fungal spores, debris, all kind of things are in the air. And we don't want that getting into our lungs because that's not a good thing. So if we take a look, a lot of the cells, a lot of the epithelium that we find in the lungs, particularly in the pathways that clear debris, they tend to be what we call ciliated columnar epithelial cells. All right, they play a role in protection um, and of the respiratory tract. Now we see the little cilia here. The cilia kind of helps to trap and move debris that may get in. We also have cells that produce mucus that's found in the respiratory tract. You know when you get sick and your, your nose gets really runny and you have a lot of mucus? Well, the mucus is produced to actually trap anything coming in. So that's an actual good response, although it may be a pain. So these cells are really important to be in the respiratory tract, the epithelium that's ciliated because it traps things. This is just once again taking a look at an actual picture, seeing the cilia appear. And we have our cells here and we have basement membranes present. And this is what it actually looks like. We can have ciliated columnar or pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells found in our respiratory tract. Right, so the next time that you find yourself blowing your nose because you have a whole lot of mucus present, um, just know that those mucus producing cells are there trying to trap debris or organisms or whatever that may come in in the air. And the next time you cough, just think about how the respiratory system is trying to eliminate or get out things that should not be in the respiratory tract. And those ciliated cells and the mucus are aiding in that. Now to tell you the importance of the ciliated cells, like I don't know if you ever heard of whooping cough. If you haven't, just go ahead on YouTube and just watch a child with whooping cough. It can be really sad. They're coughing really, really hard. It's unproductive. They can even turn blue because they can't gasp for air. And the reason why we see that in whooping cough is because the bacteria that causes whooping cough can damage the cells, the ciliated cells in the respiratory tract. So the body can't rely on those cilia to get it out. So that's that unproductive cough that we see in whooping cough. Really, really sad. There is a vaccine for that. Okay, before I get into the actual mechanism of the respiratory system, uh, I do have to talk about um, breathing in and breathing out. There are actual terms for it. Breathing in is called inspiration. So in inspiration, you're bringing air in. And while you're bringing air in, your lungs and rib cage has to expand. Okay, so we have expansion of your rib cage to make sure um, that air can get in. And how it expands is that you have um, intercostal muscles that can actually play a role in the expansion. Also, the diaphragm will move downwards to make room for when the lungs expand. That's what happens during inspiration. The opposite of inspiration is expiration. That means breathing out. So I want you to notice that the arrow is showing that the air is leaving. And I want you to take a look. Compare the lungs. You see how the lungs, lungs here is a lot smaller? Um, you see how the arrows are going down here? The intercostal muscles relax, so the rib cage is not elevated at this point. I also want you to take a look at the diaphragm. The diaphragm is relaxing too, so it's not contracted like we see here and moved down. It's actually upward. So when we're expiring, we see that the rib cage are depressed, meaning that, you know, getting smaller. And we see that the diaphragm is also relaxed compared to over here. And all of this will allow the air to go out or to expire or to breathe out. Okay, so now let's talk about respiration. We spoke about the anatomy, spoke about breathing in and out, but why do we breathe? That's the main thing. So there's two forms of respiration. We have internal respiration and we have external respiration. In internal respiration, what we're looking at is gas exchange that occurs between tissues and your red blood cell. So as you can see here, carbon dioxide is going to your red blood cells while oxygen is going to them. So this is actually happening inside your body. 
when we talk about external respiration, we're talking about air that is, or oxygen that is coming in, but this time it's not actually going to your tissues. It's actually coming in through your lungs, and through your lungs you get that initial gas exchange. And after external respiration occurs, it can go to the rest of your body. So that occurs in the lungs in the alveoli, okay, that member that has that capillary um, surrounding it. Okay, so before we can talk about the dynamics of the, how a respiratory system plays a role in gas and, and getting oxygen to your cells, we have to talk about an important structure called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is found in your red blood cells. We do have here showing you there are four parts to hemoglobin. We have two alpha subunits and we have two beta subunits. Okay, Each subunit has a center called a heme. So there's a heme group associated with it. Now, heme binds iron. Okay? And this is important because this is what will allow oxygen to bind. Right? Um, when we talk about carbon dioxide, things are a little bit different. So remember, when we see our red blood cell in this lecture, they have hemoglobin. Right? So let me draw these. They have many hemoglobin. They can have thousands and thousands to even millions of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And you know, the, it can vary because there are some conditions that will allow a person to have less hemoglobin. But just to know that we have a lot of these. So since we know about hemoglobin, let's talk more about the dynamics. Okay, let's take a deeper look at red blood cell and gas exchange. I know this looks crazy, but it really isn't. So this we're looking at external respiration. And we know that because we have the alveolus here. And then we have the red blood cell here. Now gas exchange that occurs between a red blood cell and in the alveolus or even in the tissues, that respiration, that is a passive method. All right, so what do I mean by passive method? This actually will happen due to following concentration gradient and it does not require energy. Now when oxygen that we breathe in get into cells that need oxygen, this will happen because it's going from an area of high to low um, concentrations of oxygen. So when oxygen gets in, it binds hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. All right, so this right here is oxyhemoglobin. Now, this will, can then go and get transferred to the rest of the cells. Now, I do want to mention to you, remember the heme group of hemoglobin binds the oxygen. But hemoglobin binds other things too, like carbon dioxide. Okay, so let's take a look at this a little further. So we know that there's oxyhemoglobin that is formed here that could be transferred. And we know that oxygen is bounded to the heme. But now when we talk about carbon dioxide... CO2, carbon dioxide can be transported through the system to the lungs through three different ways, okay? So um, one of the most common ways how carbon dioxide is transported is by being bicarbonate ions, okay? Bicarbonate ions. And that's what we see here, our bicarbonate ions right here. Right, let me just erase that so things don't get too complicated here. Okay. All right, so bicarbonate ions is one of the ways. Another way that we actually see is for it actually binding to the, um, the hemoglobin itself, but it doesn't bind the iron part that oxygen binds to. It binds to the other part, the globin part, the protein part. All right, so when we have hemoglobin binding carbon dioxide, all right, so when we see that carbon dioxide is binding hemoglobin, that is called carb amino hemoglobin, okay? Because now the carbon is bounded to an amino or the protonation structure of the hemoglobin. So here it can be transported this way, but it will then get converted to the bicarbonate once again. And there's an enzyme that will convert it from that bicarbonate system to or carbonic acid to um, carbon dioxide and water and that's when the carbon dioxide can leave so 
With that said, the second method is through carbamino, carbamino hemoglobin. Okay. All right. Another way how carbon dioxide can leave, because what I mentioned were what happened in the red blood cell, is that we do have some carbon dioxide that can be found in the plasma um, inside of the body. And in those cases, they will also get converted to that bicarbonate system, and then it can either go inside or outside of the red blood cell, or it can get converted and go in and get exchanged. So we see here that carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the plasma is there. Now, I just want to mention something. For those that are taking anatomy and physiology or those that are taking biology type courses, I do want to mention about this carbonate system. All right, when we have the carbonate, so the bicarbonate out here, HCO3, if it's out here and it wants to get in, um, it has to exchange with a chlorine. Or if it's inside and it wants to go outside, once again, it has to exchange with a chlorine. The chlorine exchange is just a mechanism of balancing or stabilizing the structure. Because if you're losing or gaining a, ne a negative charge that we see here, it has to be evenly exchanged with another negative charged molecule, such as chlorine. So you'll learn a little bit more about that. This is just a basic overview, so I don't want to get too much in detail with it. Now, how can the body detect that oxygen is low or carbon dioxide is high? Because we don't want carbon dioxide going up. If carbon dioxide goes up, CO2 goes up, then we have increase in acidity of the blood. So once again, if too much carbon dioxide is present, you'll have your blood becomes too acidic and that can cause your organs to shut down and a lot of other things to go wrong because we need a normal pH found inside for it to function, a more neutral pH. All right, so when your oxygen levels kind of dip or your carbon dioxide levels get too high, we have what's known as chemoreceptors that can detect the changes. And the chemoreceptors are found more in the carotid and the aortic regions. We call them the carotid or the aortic bodies. Okay, They're found in the peripheral system and they will detect changes. And when they detect changes, they can then go to the brain and they can signal to the brain we need to either increase respiration or decrease respiration. So once again, there are chemoreceptors that are found in the periphery that will detect gas levels, and they can then send that message to the brain. Now, this is an essential video, so I'm not going to go over the microscopic details of this, but I just wanted you to see this occurs in the brainstem. It's never a good idea to damage your brainstem because it takes care of those involuntary functions of our body. So if we see here, there's a region um, called the ventral or respiratory group regions um, in the medulla that plays a role in regulating your muscles that are involved in inspiration and expiration, breathing in and breathing out. And the rate of respiration can also be regulated here, right? So there are centers in the brain that can regulate your breathing and make sure that your breathing is occurring in a rhythmic way. Okay, I just do want to mention to you that these chemoreceptors are really important. They are the communication system between the body and the brain. And if you did not have that occurring, that breathing rate will be messed up. So there's a lot of synchronization going on. Okay, so since we know some of the basic essentials about the respiratory system, let's talk about some common ailments that we see occurring when things go wrong. So I know you've probably heard of asthma and bronchitis. Okay, so here um, in asthma, we have our airways, we have our bronchioles, all right, we see that. And um, we do have some muscles that do surround it. Because you remember we have three different muscle types. We have skeletal, smooth muscle, and cardiac. Well, we do have a lot of smooth muscle that surrounds. 
Now, when we talk about asthma, we get inside of the bronchioles, we get swelling of the epithelium on the inside. Um, you do get a lot of mucus that's produced. Um, and in addition to the inflammation and the mucus, which is narrowing this pathway, we also have the smooth muscle constricting. So we just have three things working against the person when they have an asthma or asthma attack. If you look here at this part, notice how open the airway is. This is a cross section. When someone has an asthma attack, we see that swelling and the mucus, so the airway is really small. And what's not showing here is that constriction of the airway. So when this happens, a person has a really hard time breathing and they have to take some kind of anti-inflammatories or other medications to keep it under control. The difference between asthma and bronchitis, um, bronchitis can occur in the bronchial tubes. And also, we see primarily inflammation and mucus, but you may not necessarily get that constriction that you see in asthma. And on bronchitis, you can have acute or chronic forms of bronchitis. Either way, they may need treatment to ensure that your airways are kept open, that you can breathe. But by far, asthma attacks are far more lethal than bronchitis. Bronchitis can be triggered by infections, so can asthma, but you can have other external factors that can trigger um, asthma as well. Another common ailment that we see in the respiratory tract is pneumonia. Um, and so we see here in the alveolar sac, remember as a recap, that gas exchange occurs here. So we need to make sure that the areas are open so gas exchange can occur. When you look here, remember we have the capillaries. Now, if you look at somebody that has pneumonia, right, so it could be viral or bacterial or even fungal pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia is the most common. We see there's a lot of mucus that will form. Notice that the mucus is coating the inside. And if that's happening, it may start filling up inside, and it's almost like liquid just being found all in your alveolar sac. If this happens, gas exchange is almost impossible to occur. And if it's impossible to occur, you know, carbon dioxide starts building up in the blood. We have oxygen that um, will be decreasing. So that is not good. Another thing that I just want to mention, it's not really a pathology or, or anything like that, but carbon monoxide. I'm sure you've heard of carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide poisoning. I just want to mention to you how it works. Carbon monoxide when it gets into your system, it actually binds to hemoglobin. Remember, carbon dioxide does not bind to the heme group. It binds to the protein part, so it doesn't compete for oxygen. But carbon monoxide is nasty. What it does is actually binds the hemoglobin, and it competes, and it will not let go of the hemoglobin. If that happens, oxygen cannot get through your system. I just want to mention that. So when you hear people talking about carbon monoxide poisoning and why it's important for you to get, you know, if, if you suspect that there's carbon monoxide, you need to get tested. Now you know why, because carbon monoxide can basically suffocate you by blocking oxygen's ability to bind the heme group on the hemoglobin. All right, so that was a lot of concepts. Let's go ahead and have our quiz and let's see what you remember. All right, so the first question. The respiratory system, and you need to select all that applies, brings oxygen to the red blood cells, play a role in providing oxygen for tissues of the body, causes elimination of carbon dioxide from the body, involved in pumping blood around the body, or none of the above. So, if we're talking about a respiratory system, hopefully you would have picked these three. So it brings oxygen to the red blood cells. It does provide oxygen to the tissues of the body because remember, once your red blood cells are oxygenated, it will go to the tissue of the body. It causes elimination of carbon dioxide from the body. You remember this, um, that carbon dioxide can leave the body. All right, so it involves pumping blood around the body. No, the heart does that. So these three are the choices. Next one, the tissue present in the airways are, are they ciliated, flat, tubular, discs, or none of the above? So airways. So I'm looking more so along the lines of, let's say, the trachea or the bronchi. What type of 
tissue would be present. Hopefully you would say ciliated. Now, if I was talking about the alveolar sac or the region of gas exchange, it would not be ciliated. Okay, so if I'm talking about the alveolar, then you would tell me flat. Okay, but for right now I'm talking more of the tracheal region or let's say the tracheal or the bronchi. The region where external respiration occurs is in is it in the nose, trachea, bronchioles, alveoli, or bronchi. Where does external respiration occur? Hopefully you said alveoli. If you did, you are correct. All right, so let's see this one. Capillaries play a critical role in gas exchange during external respiration. Is that statement true or false? Capillaries playing a role in external respiration. If you said true, you are correct. What is responsible for detection of gas levels in the blood? Are they mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, nuclear receptor, brain centers, or none of the above? If you picked chemoreceptors, you're, okay, you're absolutely correct. You're okay there. Remember, chemoreceptors include the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies that are found in the peripheral system. And they detect oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels, and they can regulate um, the brain centers. Now, there's also chemoreceptors in the brain. So the cent brain centers help to regulate the breathing, but detection is by chemoreceptors. What happens to the blood when too much carbon dioxide builds up? Does it become acidic, basic, acidic, or neutral? Hopefully you said acidic. When carbon dioxide binds hemoglobin, that structure is called oxyhemoglobin, car carbaminohemoglobin, protons, heme, or none of the above. Which one is, when carbon dioxide binds hemoglobin, which one is it? Hopefully it's carb amino hemoglobin, okay? So if we have that, if you have that answer, you are correct. How many ways can carbon dioxide be transported? Hopefully you remember. Is it one, two, three, four, or five? If you picked three ways, you're correct. Remember that carbon dioxide can bind to hemoglobin to form carb amino hemoglobin. Or it can be in the bicarbonate form in the red blood cell that then can get converted to carbon dioxide. Or you can have it, the carbon dioxide diffused in the plasma, right, in the form of bicarbonate ions that then can exchange um, to carbon dioxide. So there's three different forms of carbon dioxide being transported. When oxygen binds hemoglobin, that structure is called oxyhemoglobin. The act of breathing in is called what? Inspiration, alteration, expiration, or none of the above. Hopefully you said inspiration. And obviously if that's breathing in, breathing out is expiration. All right, so hopefully you got 100 on the quiz. If you miss some of the concepts, please go back and watch the video again. These are very important concepts about the respiratory system. Please leave a comment. Let me know how you did or what you learned. Until next time, bye.